you cannot penetrate me. No, I'm the guy that has nothing to lose, and I really don't give a f what anybody thinks. Oh boy, oh boy, he was a mess from the start. The 10 second long attention span was evident, and Chef Ramsay's reaction to him doing, well, anything made that clear. When the latter fired off the first ticket, Chino needed a repeat, but this was in his prep school. I'm sorry, Chef, can you repeat that? Can I repeat that? I'm, I'm sorry, yeah, Chef. Yeah, let me repeat it. F yourself. Moving on to the entrees, Chino's miso cod came out looking like it had been on the grill for a minute or 22 long. Imagine my shock when Chef Ramsay got up in his face about it. I burned the miso cod. You know, I should know too, because I'm Asian. Anyway, this led to his timeout at the chef's table, where sous chef Scott kindly assigned him some garlic prep duty. Definitely something more his speed. There you go, at least you won't be able to burn any of that. Ugh, horrible. But hey, nothing improved in the second service as well. He and Jonathan paired up at the appetizer station, but things went down the drain real fast there too. The first table ended, and while Brendan's orders were making their way to the pass, Chino's risotto was lagging eons behind schedule. And Chino and the rest of his team may as well have been on different planets, considering how poorly they were communicating. How long out on the risotto? Anyway, Chef Ramsay tore into Chino for being too fixated on the rice. When Chino finally sent out his first risotto, well, he made sure to burn it in effigy before the customers could even get their hands on it. And the entire pan went into the trash. So what about round two? Same burnt story. Chef Ramsay's disappointment was written all over his face. I've got another burnt risotto. It's fucking burnt! The incomplete table had to go out or, well, everybody would have gone hungry. Apologize, the risotto's behind it, yes? Come on, Chino! Despite the crash and burn, he somehow survived. Again. Some time later, he stepped into the role of assistant maitre d'oeuvre for the family night dinner service. But his debut wasn't exactly turning any heads. Gino! 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 When he handed Chef Ramsay the first ticket, well, let's just say Ramsay couldn't make a head or tail of Chino's handwriting. On top of the chicken scratch, Chino forgot a crucial detail, the sides. He was lucky the blue team won in spite of his efforts. And no sides? No, I didn't, Chef. Oh, piss off, Chino. After the blue team's loss in the chicken creation challenge, they decided to roll up their sleeves and simulate a dinner service for some extra practice. His team was left disheartened as Chino stumbled through the practice without any actual cooking involved. It was clear that he was a liability, even when the stakes were as low as possible. How long? You gotta give me four minutes, dude. Yeesh. Three minutes on a Three minutes on a Three minutes. Minute. During the dinner service, Chino was holding down the meat station with Paul. Things were rolling smoothly until a few speed bumps showed up. Jonathan then stepped in, lending a hand with those Wellingtons. Team effort, you know? But what did Chino know about it? Then came the chef's table's order. Chino confidently called out one minute. Seeing him struggle, Natalie jumped in to help, and sous chef Scott wanted an update. And then Chino's timing was suddenly a whole lot different. How long until it's ready? It's gonna be three more minutes, chef. So you need three minutes? Now, instead of just accepting any assistance whatsoever, Chino's response was entitled as hell. He brushed off Natalie's advice completely, claiming her approach wasn't helpful. You don't need to preach to me, okay? So it doesn't help. It doesn't help, okay? And then the Wellingtons. Chino's moment to shine turned into a kitchen nightmare. Oh, wait, 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 wrong show. But I mean, if you left him to his own devices, I'm sure he could have made any of Chef Ramsay's restaurants need a rescue from his own show. Anyway, when they finally made their way out, Chef Ramsay's reaction said it all raw. Hey, at least he didn't burn it this time, right? Chef Ramsay then ordered a kitchen-wide inspection. And, well, it was back to square one for Chino. It's raw. Raw! But then came his second attempt. And how did that turn out? That is raw. That is white. What is that? So now you just fucked. Yep, still raw. And that was the final straw. The blue team got the boot from the kitchen, all thanks to those undercooked Wellingtons and lamb. All of you, fuck off out of here. Get upstairs. Chino's refusal to accept help coupled with his failure to deliver a properly cooked dish was his team's undoing. He knew he messed up, but instead of owning up to it, he seemed to think that Natalie made him look bad. When she tried to be the bigger person and apologize for how she spoke to him, his response was just harsh. Natalie, don't make me look worse. I was trying to help you, and if it came off that way, I'm sorry. And then, to top it all off, when Natalie started getting really emotional, instead of showing a bit of empathy or remorse, Chino doubled down. 
he had the nerve to think that she was just crying for attention. She likes to put on a show and it's a joke. I, I, what, what, I do, kiss your ass all the time? I wasn't lying. I mean, what the heck, man? His treatment of Natalie was a real low point. It felt like the whole blue team was on board with welcoming Natalie, except for him. I wonder why. Now, luck played a big part for Chino in the earlier episodes. Steven's mishaps, Brendan's blatantly obvious lie, and bam, the blue team snagged a win in episode 3. But when it came to episode 4, oh boy, Chino had nowhere to hide. Let's be real here, in that episode, Chino's cooking game was just not up to par. And there's a genuinely valid argument that he was one of the most incompetent chefs to ever grace the show. And his behavior towards Natalie on his elimination night was totally uncalled for. Making someone cry just because they were trying to lend you a hand is downright disgusting. Anyway, it's gotta be embarrassing to be humiliated on the show when you know your family would inevitably witness it on TV. I'd keep my attitude in check for this very reason. And if you're with me, then drop a like, subscribe, and turn on my post notifications. But as it turns out, Andrew over here couldn't care less. He decided to take the whole flirting game to a whole new level. Enjoy my boo. Mm -hmm. I get married in a couple months. Probably not going to be a strong relationship. Ugh. The dude not only flirted with another contestant, but also casually dropped that the Playboy Mansion was the highlight of his life, all while having a fiance. Are you circling my bald spot right now? No. That's really balding. I mean, it depends how you comb it. Like really? Cheating is never a good look, and Andrew not only betrayed his fiance, but also acted like it was just another day for him. Andrew, here's your grandma Helen and your girlfriend Leela. So not only was Andrew in a way too one-sided open relationship, but he also had a knack for being excessively loud. What's more, he always had an excuse for everything, including his lack of leadership skills. During some reward or other, when Devin suggested toning down his decibel level, Andrew had a full-blown disagreement. All we gotta do is humble ourselves, and let's be more soft-spoken and communicate with respect. Hey, by the way, he's right. But according to him, being loud was just a Philadelphia thing. I'm from Philly. I'm loud, I'm boisterous, that's how I am. Oh, of course, that explains it. Philadelphians, comment down below and let me know if this piece of work represents you. But let's be real here, if your leadership style relies on heavily yelling, you're not exactly leadership material. Like at least Chef Ramsay has two volume settings and can string together an intelligible sentence. Good leaders should be in the business of lifting people up, not blowing their eardrums out. Now, time for the Indian cuisine dinner service from season 13, where one contestant messed up big time. It was an interesting mix on the menu, with classics and some traditional Indian dishes like tandoori chicken and off-the-wall stuff like Panera flatbread pizza. Celebs like Billy Gibson, Uzo Aduba, and Lisa Garo showed up as well. Chef Ramsay threw down the gauntlet with Santos and Bryant, asking them to whip up a flatbread pizza. Bryant decided to take the reins. Now, Aaron was trying to keep things smooth, but Bryant, in an attempt to help on the fish station, ended up sending up a raw scallop. But guess whose fault that was? Still stone cold in the Who cooked them? No answer. Who cooked them? My station, I take responsibility. Uh. Later, Brian tried to weasel his way out. But you certainly didn't go, I cooked them. Because I was like, Bleh, and you're like, I don't know. Jump on it. Okay, how could I? Wait, what? Then Brian got into a spat with Shade, who called him out over his patronizing attitude. Don't give me shit, Brian. I don't need to hear you. Fine. Because you're Got not fucking talking. Despite the internal bickering, the blue team managed to get their appetizers out. The kitchen chaos continued though, with fish orders piling up, Aaron causing a small fire, and Brian stepping in to handle it. Chef Ramsay wondered if what he was seeing was even real. Shade and Bryant were still at odds, and Santos called out the situation for what it was, a huge mess. Aaron can't even figure out where the fuck he's at. It's a fucking absolute shit show right now. Sade and Brian are ready to just go toe-to-toe -to -toe and slug it out. Then Aaron sent out a raw salmon, and Chef Ramsay uncovered Bryant's raw garnishes. Touch that. Touch that. Rock. Okay, let's admit it, the men were lost without Sterling. I guess you don't want to jump over to the blue team, Sterling. No thank you, Chef. Now, Bryant's anger took the center stage during the deliberations. Oh yeah, Mr. Nice Guy was a thing of the past, and he declared that he was done playing nice. I'm done playing nice. I'm, I'm seriously done. I am fucking done. Uh-huh, bro, we get you. However, things quickly escalated when Bryant confronted Aaron about not heeding his advice. Accusations were thrown around and it turned into a heated exchange. I don't know why you, tonight, you listen to her more than you listen to Garnet. Because she was more organized than you were. Seriously, why was he acting like that? 
You need a bullhorn at the end of the table here to talk over me, to talk to you. Dude, calm down, no, you ass you. you. Then he considered nominating Fernando, who in return criticized Bryant's inability to make a coherent argument and called out his awful attitude. Your attitude sucks. You will never be able to fucking manage a braguet with that fucking attitude. Absolutely right, my man. As Bryant's temper flared, Shade urged him to cool it, and Aaron reminded him of the raw scallop incident. You sent up raw scallops for me tonight. You fucking putting justifying on me, showing that you are a weak ass man. Despite Brian claiming that he would take responsibility, there was a lingering concern about a potential physical altercation. Brian was unfazed and taunted the team to nominate him, asserting that he'd survive anyway. Y'all can each vote for me, that's fine, but I'm not leaving. By the way, he's the only finalist I just can't bring myself to support. The guy came off as arrogant, annoying, and overly self-assured. While I wouldn't call it anger issues, he seemed like he was just trying to project toughness. Um, I'm dominant more than you. That's why I'm standing. Everyone knows how the fuck I roll, man. We've set the fucking tone now. That perpetual scowl on his face with those angry eyebrows gave off a vibe of all show and no substance. Don't call me honey. I'm not your honey or sweetie or any of these other fucking pet names. Tell me, tell me about me. Tell me about me then. Now, what do you think? Speaking of, another chef who had unparalleled delusions of grandeur is Amber from season 19. She made a return for the final dinner service among the seven chefs. When Corey chose Jordan over her, she seemed really surprised. I really thought she was talking about me and going to pick me. My feelings are a little hurt. It's just business, so it is what it is. Sorry, but the finale isn't about your feelings. Mary Lou selected her as the third addition to her team after Cody and Nikki and Lauren followed. That night, she confronted Corey for not choosing her like a hurt little child. Despite Corey explaining that it wasn't personal, Amber continued to harbor resentment. She vented to both Mary Lou and Lauren, dismissing Corey's decision as her loss. I'm surprised you picked Jordan before you picked me. Okay, well, it hurt my feelings. Even though she claimed to be over it, Amber still gave Corey a hard time the next day, much to Corey's annoyance. You know, it makes me feel like you think I can't go. And that's not it. That's not it at all. This is going crazy. Like, girl, snap out of it. During the dinner service, Amber took charge of the meat station. At one point, she expressed concern about Lauren, who seemed a bit spaced out. When it came to the entrees, she was pleased to finish in the red kitchen, confident in Mary Lou's victory. However, she couldn't resist reminding Corey that not picking her was her loss. It is definitely your loss. You do not have me on your team tonight. But was it? Well, you be the judge. In the meantime, Chef Ramsay noticed that Amber forgot to include the chicken in her entrees. So we forgot the chicken? Yes, yeah, Chef. Now we've f***ed up. This is all shit. We're not sending that. Mary Lou had to call her team down, and when asked about the chicken delay, Amber estimated seven minutes. This led Mary Lou to refire the entire table, struggling to maintain composure with Amber. During her second attempt, Amber, determined to get it right, readied her refired chicken for the pass. However, Lauren was concerned about the chicken's texture. Undeterred, Amber was ready to serve it and face the consequences. Unfortunately, Lauren's worries were really justified as the chicken turned out to be as raw as could be. This was a fact that Mary Lou did not hesitate to show the rest of the team. All of you come back here right now. Everybody come back right now. Okay, my chicken's raw. I need you all to be on the exact same page. In response, Mary Lou made the call to switch stations for Amber and Cody. But Amber came away from it frustrated, especially since Cody managed to get his chicken accepted. So annoying because it's like, boy toy to the rescue. How insulting. In the end, Mary Lou lost the finale to Corey. Guess Corey managed just fine without Amber, huh? She didn't want me, then that's her loss. Her loss indeed. I guess Karma decided to swing by after that little declaration, and I have to admit, it was really satisfying to watch it unfold. Up next is this contestant who couldn't get enough button pushing. Winning Hell's Kitchen would totally change my life. It's Jason who won Hell's Kitchen and has his pocket full of money to beat women off with a stick for God's sake. Jason's sexist remarks throughout his time on the show were downright offensive. I'll be damned if I'm gonna lose to a team of girls. The only thing I'm gonna lose to a woman is like an ironing contest. His confidence in winning solely because of the team's high spirit was not only misguided, but also demonstrated a dismissive attitude toward the women's capabilities without a man to lead them. I don't lose the fucking girls, especially a bunch of young little kids. What's perplexing is while he was quick to undermine the women, he had literally zero cooking skills. So what exactly made him feel so superior? I'm thinking a superiority complex. Anyway, cut to the time that Chef Ramsay discovered Jason's raw halibut. 
It's a, well, it's a little more raw than you wanted it, yes, Chef? A little, okay. Uh, Despite Chef Ramsay's attempt to guide and help him, Jason's halibut returned raw yet again. And you're sending me raw fish, but it's fucking cold, it's fucking raw. And then, instead of owning up to his mistake, he denied everything. And that, in no small part, resulted in the entire freaking restaurant being shut down. No, I'm not kidding. And of course, his struggle at the dessert station was quite a spectacle. When Chef Ramsay quizzed him about the menu, Jason barely even knew what was on it. This led Chef Ramsay sending him to the dorms to study the menu. Yeah, go hit the books, bud. After the dorm, in the mirror, breathe in, chest out, read the dessert. Now, when he finally got back into the kitchen, Chef Ramsay took him aside again to test his knowledge of the desserts. Jason struggled and even started saying that he was looking for the door. Chocolate fondant with, um... Oh, no. no, I know this shit. I've hit my breaking point. I'm at the bottom. So much for our big, strong alpha male, huh? Chef Ramsay wasn't ready to let him throw in the towel, though. I come know here, come here. the menu. I just want to go home. But if you ask me, he should have been ejected. It would have saved everyone a ton of trouble and heartache. Like, remember Jessica? She packed her bags as a result of a lot less whining. So, what did Chef Ramsay see in him? Anyway, as Jason finally started preparing his desserts, it became apparent, if it wasn't already, that he was out of his depth. He even made a rather demeaning remark about women being better at making desserts. Laurent stepped in to assist, informing him that his creme brulees were ready. But our boy Jason could hardly believe it. Your creme brulee's done already. No, it's not. That's not cooked. When Chef Ramsay tried to get to the bottom of how spectacularly he had failed, Jason shared the issue. And Ramsay offered a solution, involving rubbing sugar around the rim with butter and cocoa powder. But was Jason about to take the notes and, you know, move on? See? Told you. He pushed way too many buttons. Up next, let's look at Jackie. Jackie wrote the list. Why would you write that? Jackie's actions during prep were completely out of line. First off, deciding to rename the prep list as the fucking list was a move that earned her a well-deserved berating from sous chef Christina. The lecture that followed, where she warned the entire red team about the consequences of such behavior, should have been a wake-up call for Jackie, right? If any of this happens in this kitchen again, whoever writes it will be finishing the list. Rather than acknowledging her mistake, Jackie tried to argue that it wasn't disrespectful, showing a lack of understanding and defiance. This led to sous chef Christina's fury. She not only sent her to the chef's table, but also made it clear that she would have fired her if this happened in her own kitchen. It's a professional kitchen. You would be fired if you, if you work for me. Accusing Jackie of not caring and calling her the cancer of the red team, sous chef Christina made it abundantly clear just how much of a pain she was to have around. During the cowboy steak night dinner service, Jackie found herself on the appetizer station alongside Chad. Initially, she was unnecessarily concerned about Chad integrating into their service flow. And that was even though he managed to get his appetizers out just fine. Moving on to the entrees, Ariel requested Jackie's help with the tuna, explicitly cautioning her not to overcook them. I got it, I got it, don't worry about it. Make sure I don't overcook. They're still cold in the middle. Unfortunately, Jackie's tuna turned out to be burnt, prompting Ariel to accuse her of not providing the assistance she promised. You can't figure out what the f you're supposed to do with you're not helping me. Go back to your seat. This misstep contributed to the red team losing the service. Ultimately, this led to the time-honored tradition of nominating two team members for elimination. During the deliberations, instead of taking responsibility for her role in the burnt tuna incident, Jackie started dodging every ounce of blame thrown her way. The big part is when you come to help people, you have to actually be able to help them. She reminded Ashley of her perceived steak searing issues and suggested that if the fish and meat stations hadn't fallen apart, they wouldn't have been kicked out of the service. When Ariel rightfully brought up the burnt tuna, Jackie appeared to be in denial, insisting that she did nothing wrong. Everything I cooked today was perfect, and I try to help everybody, and they want to throw me in. Jackie's behavior took a seriously disturbing turn. First off, she shocked everyone by revealing that... Oh, I only been cooking for three months! Yeah, she had only been cooking for three months, yet somehow felt entitled to run BLT steak. You know what? F all of them, really. I just hate it that we can't choke people here. Uh, just to be clear, you shouldn't go around choking people anywhere. <laughs> Least of all in Hell's Kitchen. After surviving elimination, which was a freaking miracle, let me tell you, back at the dorms, Jackie continued her antics. She mockingly questioned Kristen about having someone with just three months of cooking experience on the same level. Kristen, rightfully frustrated, pointed out that Jackie had no idea what she was doing. 
You've only been cooking three months. You don't know what the f you're doing. Everything about you is a sack of The situation escalated when Jackie, in a confrontational manner, taunted Kristen and even threw her letter to the ground, leading to a heated argument. No pun intended. Either like a cigarette or give me my letter. Things took an even darker turn when Jackie dumped an ashtray on Kristen's shoulder. This prompted Kristen to express her disgust and frustration. Kristen, put your hands up. Done. Done. Put your hands up. Out of my fit. Eventually, Kristen decided that she had had enough and left the patio, questioning what was wrong with Jackie. Jackie's admission that she was playing mind games with Kristen because she couldn't physically harm her is deeply troubling. Kristen, it's a game now, and it is to with your mind. That's what happens when you can't strangle a bitch. This kind of hostility and manipulation is beyond unacceptable. It's just plain frustrating to watch. I couldn't even begin to imagine how her fellow chefs must have felt. So, which other chefs do you think push Chef Ramsay or any of their fellow contestants to the brink of madness? Make sure to drop those names in the comments section down below. And before you leave, don't forget to check out this next video right here. It's even better, trust me.